that you have there. Not a problem. We can do All right, thank you. Well, good evening all. Uh, my name is Dan Saunders, I'm the chairperson of the uh, Growth Planning Committee for the Town of Kenny Bunkport. And I and the other members of the GPC would like to thank you for joining our public input workshop on land use planning. Uh, I'd like to introduce the other committee members. Uh, they're Jim Fitzgerald, who's our vice chair, Janet Powell, our secretary, Paul Hogan, and Jim McMahon. And we also have two alternates uh, who participate in our meetings and then fill in as voting members uh, when needed when one of the regular members is off. And that's Mike Corsi and Liz Johnson, uh, who just joined our group. And then providing direction and keeping us on track, of course, is uh, Warner Gilliam, as you all know, uh, our 
uh, director of planning uh, and our town representative. And then leading us through uh, the rewrite of our comprehensive plan, uh, which is required every 10 years, is our consulting team of Ms. Durfee of EF Design and Planning and Tom Morgan of TZM Planning. Um, we're going to cover a lot of things this evening in land use, uh, but I wanted to you know, sort of point out again the importance of our comprehensive plan. And it is what sets our vision of our town uh, so that town can then effectively and efficiently plan and allocate their, you know, the finite resources they have to work towards that future. It helps our town plan for tomorrow's challenges, some of which we are starting to see today. Uh, things such as sea level rise and increased flooding that impacts the coastal town and what steps we need to take in place to mitigate their impact uh, as we move forward to impact our infrastructure, impact our residents, impact our economy. It's a tool to help our town uh, become more sustainable in our actions as we work to preserve many of the town's great historical attributes that led us to move here or led our four uh, followers to move here. Um, and additionally, the, the comprehensive plan is a legal requirement for zoning, for impact fees, for uh, protecting the rate of growth ordinances. A plan that's been approved by the state is, is one um, that will help us uh, get a preferred status if we seek uh, state grants for programs. And it will require state agencies to follow our zoning standards. And also it's a document that when a land use ordinance is written or revised and it's found to be consistent with our comprehensive plan it gives it legal standing in case we're challenged ever uh, by someone who uh, feels that they shouldn't have to uh, apply with that ordinance so it's an important document and it's also an important reason for this workshop is to discuss about our future land use and what we want that to look like so that we ensure that this plan this comprehensive plan um, will be written to, to show consistency with those with those changes that we may make in the future. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn this uh, this work session over to uh, Liz and Tom. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I'm Liz Durfee, as Dan mentioned, a planning consultant working with Tom Morgan on, on this comprehensive plan update. Um, before I get started, I just want to make sure, can everyone see the full uh, PowerPoint display, presentation display um, on their screens right now? Sure can, Liz. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Okay, great. Well, here we go. We've got a pretty ambitious agenda, so we're, um, we're not going to waste any time with getting started. I'm going to go over just a couple of ground rules for Zoom. It's probably not new for most of you at this point, um, but we'll just go over a couple of basic guidelines for during the presentation, and then I'll highlight some of the Zoom features that will allow everyone to participate today during the discussion and polling periods. So first, we ask that everyone keep, keep yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Even uh, if you're not speaking, there can be background noise, um, and that can be very distracting. And hard for others to hear. We have um, the ability to use the chat box feature, which I'll point out in just a moment throughout the meeting. And you can use this chat box or the hand raise function during the discussions to participate and share, respond to questions. If you're joining us from your phone today, there's a couple options to participate. You can hit star six to unmute and remute yourself again. Uh, and you can also pre press star nine to uh, virtually raise your hand. We're gonna do our best to get to all of the comments and questions today, but if we don't, you can always follow up after the meeting. Um, our project email is listed on the screen here, gpc at kennybunkportcp.info. You can call the planning office. We can get in touch with you um, that way. And you can attend the Growth Planning Committee meetings, um, which are every uh, first and third Tuesday. This screen shows a few of the uh, Zoom features that we'll be using today. First, if you're not familiar with muting and unmuting and starting and stopping your video, 
there are tools that are on the um, menu bar of your Zoom page. They're often at the bottom, but not always. Like you can uh, float that menu around. Look for the mute and unmute uh, icon and the video. If there's a red line through it, that means you're muted um, and we can't see you, but otherwise we can see and hear you. This little chat icon that looks like a word cloud is the option to open up the chat box. And similarly, that may be docked to the side of your Zoom window, but it also might be floating around. So take a look at that box. If you click on the chat icon, um, you should have the ability to type in a message uh, and you can type it to everyone and everyone that's in this meeting will be able to read your message and will be able to respond to your comments during the discussion period. In the middle of the screen, you'll see a screenshot of some of the different options that you can use to control your own window. When we have a PowerPoint displayed, um, which we will for most of the uh, meeting tonight, you have limited ability to display everyone's videos, but you can scroll through and see um, who's participating and everyone's uh, video should show if they have their cameras on and if not, um, a name. Again, we have the information. If you're participating by phone, you can hit star six to mute or unmute yourself and star nine to, to raise your hand. And lastly, how to raise your hand, um, there is a button called reactions. You might have to look under a more menu, but you should be able to find reactions. Um, on this screenshot, it shows a smiley face. If you click on that, there is a, a way to virtually raise your hand. And when you hit that button, a hand will pop up next to your uh, window and we'll be able to see that you have something to say. We're gonna do our best to call on people in the order that we see hands, but um, given the number of people that are here tonight, it's, um, you know, we might, we might not be able to be uh, completely in order. So please um, be patient with us on that end. Lastly, if you have any um, major issues with getting Zoom to work, you can always unmute yourself and just interrupt during the discussion and we'll get to your question. We don't want the Zoom technology to get in anyone's way. Here's our agenda for tonight. There's a full uh, agenda posted on our project webpage and uh, Tom's gonna put the link to the project website in the chat box. So this is a good opportunity to um, check out the chat box um, and get familiar with that if you haven't used that function before. You should be able to click directly on the link and it will take you to the, the project website. Um, and we'll be referring to a couple different links throughout the night that you can uh, check out in the chat box and look for more information. And at the end of the night, we'll save the dialogue that's in the chat so that um, if we aren't able to get to all of the comments and questions, then we'll have a record of that and we can share that with everyone later on. You'll see after this um, first, the first three lines of intro, we've got um, three main sessions for our workshop tonight. The first session, is going to be on some general zoning, zoning districts and uses concepts. We'll follow that with a very short poll that everyone will have the opportunity to participate in and then a facilitated discussion. And we'll repeat that format a couple times for our three topics. Second topic is on residential development and trends. And then the third topic is on sea level rise and hazards. The goals of our work session tonight are to share some information with you about existing land use, desired land use, uh, and collect some information um, from you about what you'd like to see in the town with respect to land use, residential land use, talk about some opportunities, some hazards, including sea level rise, and then um, what we'll be doing afterwards is collecting collecting your input and using it to inform development of the future land use chapter and strategies and some of the conceptual maps for the comprehensive plan. 
this isn't the most user-friendly slide, um, but it's a one-page snapshot of our uh, process and timeline. You can see that we started way back in September of 2019. That sounds, um, seems like a lifetime ago at this point. Um, Pre-COVID times, we have met with the growth planning committee uh, twice a month, uh, with the exception of a few months when we uh, paused our work during um, the peak COVID pandemic. We've been working on developing 15 topic chapters. We've had a series of um, public in input sessions, uh, presentations, mini surveys. Um, we had a workshop that I think some of you attended, I recognize some names in July, which was nice to have, I think it was one of my only in-person workshops the whole year. And um, here we are at the end of September with our future land use workshop. Following this workshop, we'll work on finalizing the vision chapter. We'll be developing the future land use chapter, and then we'll spend quite a bit of time looking at uh, the strategies and goals that will be going into the plan for all chapters. Before we... Um, get started with the zoning presentation, I want to take a quick step back and just reintroduce the concept of a comprehensive plan. This is a long-term planning document, typically a 10-year plan that examines existing conditions off a wide spectrum of issues, identifies policies and strategies, and guides land use, investment, and decision-making. There's four key components that are required under Maine's, Maine's Growth Management Act, and, and those are an inventory and analysis, policy development, implementation strategy, and regional coordination program, um, which includes addressing sea level rise. A comprehensive plan is required for uh, enacting legal zoning, impact fees, and a rate of growth ordinances. So now we're going to move into um, our first presentation. And since I can't see my clock here, I'm just going to set my timer so I don't go over here. Okay. So our first presentation is on basic concepts of zoning. I'll go over a brief review of the zoning districts um, and uses and some dimensional requirements in the town of County Bunkport, as well as a few topics of interest that came up during our joint meeting with the planning board and in our growth planning committee meetings uh, over the last couple of years. Following the slides, as I mentioned, we're going to do a short poll and then we'll have a discussion on the types of land uses you would like to see in different areas of town. So keep that in mind during this um, slideshow. A zoning ordinance as defined by the state is a type of, of land use ordinance that divides a municipality into districts that prescribes and reasonably applies different regulations in each, each district. And Kenny Bunkport's zoning ordinance is part of its land use ordinance, which is part of the town code. And Tom is going to include a link to that in the chat box if you want to um, take a deep dive into the zoning ordinance uh, during this discussion or at a later time. The purpose of a zoning ordinance is broad. Um, Kenny Bunkport's zoning ordinance purpose is to promote and conserve health, safety, convenience, and welfare of inhabitants to encourage the most appropriate interrelationships of land uses and groups of land uses in the various parts of the town to secure safely from fire, panic, epidemics, flooding and other dangers to provide adequate access of light and air to prevent overcrowding of real estate, to lessen congestion in streets and to facilitate the adequate provision of transportation, water, sanitary facilities, schools, parks, and other public requirements and to preserve and increase amenities throughout the town of Kenny Bunkport. So it sounds like the zoning ordinance does a lot, uh, which it does and um, that's why we're spending some time on it uh, tonight. Zoning ordinances break down a municipality into different districts. You can see uh, Kenny Bunkport zoning ordinance here. 
or excuse me, zoning map here. The town has 11 traditional zoning districts and one contract zone, which is called the Goat Island contract zone. Uh, this is a special rezone area that doesn't meet the standards of other districts and it has some specific re restrictions. The town has also several overlay districts, such as the floodplain overlay district and shoreland areas that protect uh, water resources and surrounding upland areas. Within each of the zoning districts, there are different regulations that um, identify the types of uses that are permitted, as well as conditional uses that are allowed under review and approval by the planning board or the zoning board, as well as uses that aren't permitted. This table just shows a selection of uh, those uses. You'll see some, some header rows in blue here, such as residential uses, agriculture, or forestry. Um, we don't expect you to be able to read through this entire table right now. And if you want to check out the full table, there's two pages of this sort of consolidated permitted use table. The link is in the chat box. Um, Liz, are you able to see the chat box? Um, I don't have it on, but... Okay. Oh, there's a question. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the answer to the question is, is click the link and, and you'll um, get, get the full uh, table. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Tom. If you click the link, you can um, actually download a PDF and then you can zoom in um, and take a look at it. I can't uh, enlarge this because we're in presentation mode, unfortunately. So, um, so our, one of the take home messages on this slide without getting into too much detail about all of the different zones and the different uses is that there are quite a few different categories of uses. And you can find similarities and differences with respect to the different types of uses that are permitted in some of the more uh, urban uh, or suburban and then rural areas of town. Another set of regulations that varies by district is the dimensional standards. And this includes um, the lot sizes, setbacks, which are the distance a building is from the front and the rear and the side lot lines, height requirements, uh, area of land per dwelling unit, and lot coverage. So these standards constrain the development that it can occur on individual lots, but it, they also contribute to broader patterns of land use in a community. Um, particularly with respect to the need to drive versus walk. They also impact accessibility for emergency response and the look and feel of neighborhoods, which we'll get into a little bit more in our next presentation. They also impact land prices and therefore housing and the cost for doing business. Again, you can find this table. This is not the complete table. There's two pages um, for, uh, for this table of dimensional requirements, you can find that um, in the link to the chat uh, that is on our project website. And I'd also take a pause. Um, I forgot to mention if you are participating over the phone, you can find the link to the PowerPoint presentation on the website also. So the project website is kennybunkportcp.info. So if you want to take a look at the slides, scroll through them on your own, or if you're only participating over the phone, you can find the slides uh, that way too. This graphic shows um, very generally how the districts relate to each other. On the Y axis, we have lot size, um, and residential density, which generally has an uh, inverse relationship with lot size. So as you move higher in this chart on the vertical axis towards the top of the screen, you're seeing larger lot size in those districts. So for example, uh, Forest and Farm has the largest lot size requirement uh, in the town. And as you move down, you'll see smaller lot sizes and uh, greater residential density. If you move across the horizontal axis um, from left to right, you're seeing in general um, more types of permitted land uses. So in farm and forest, free enterprise, Cape Porpoise Square, Dock Square, there are more non-residential uses permitted than in 
um, the more residential or strictly residential districts of the Village Residential East and Goose Rocks, for example. So during our conversations with the Growth Planning Committee and the Planning Board, uh, one of the issues that came up was that often residents seem surprised about the types of uses that are permitted in the forest and farm, which is the darker green and the free enterprise zones, uh, which are uh, the two largest zones in the town of Kennebunkport. And you can see they're in the central and northwest side of town. I pasted in the dimensional requirements here. We're not going to get into too much detail, but you can see that there are some familiar, some uh, similarities between these two districts with respect to their dimensional requirements. But one of the main areas that's different is the minimum lot size. So in the free enterprise zone, a minimum the minimum lot size is um, 40,000 square feet, which is approximately one acre. Whereas in the forest and farm, it's about three acres. And this means that, you know, there are lots that are definitely larger than, than those sizes in these two districts. But in order to subdivide or uh, break up a lot into multiple lots, you need to have at least that minimum lot size. Here are a bunch of images of the types of uses that are um, allowed in the forest and farm and the free enterprise prize zone, um, either allowed by right or by a review and approval um, with the planning board or with the zoning board. The permitted uses in these two different districts aren't exactly the same, um, but they're fairly similar. Um, and most of the uses that are permitted in one are permitted under some form of review in, in the other. And you can see that these uses range from single family homes and duplexes to libraries and community centers, uh, agriculture, animal husbandry, logging, commercial centers, um, auto-oriented businesses, uh, most types of land uses that you can think of um, are permitted, um, not heavy industrial and also not multiplexes, which are uh, residential dwellings with three or more units. There are a couple of what we could call town center or commercial areas in town, as I think that all of you are familiar with, Dock Square and Cape Corpus are two areas where um, the presence of non-residential uses is more prominent than other areas of town. These occupy a relatively small area of town. You can see Dock Square down in that uh, orange colors, a really, really small, um, but very vibrant area of the community. Um, these these commercial areas, not surprisingly, cater less to um, your resident or your agricultural and, and forestry uses than other areas of town do. And of note is the fact that both of these areas are located along waterfronts. The uh, Kennebunk River is running right, right along this lower western side of town. And then up the eastern side of town is... Uh, the coastline. And we'll get into a discussion on sea level rise vulnerability a little bit later tonight. There are four districts that are um, primarily residential only districts. Um, these are the village residential, village residential east, Cape Arundel and Goose Rock zones. These areas do permit some community uses like libraries, parks, and churches, um, as well as agriculture and timber management. And village residential and village residential east do allow multiplexes. So those are the uh, dwelling units with three or more uh, units. There's several water dependent uses in Kenny Bunkport's land use ordinance. The ordinance defines functionally water dependent uses as those that require for their primary purpose location on submerged lands or lands that require direct access to or location in coastal or inland waters and that cannot be located away from these waters. This table here shows um, 
a summary of where these uses are allowed. The CSU stands for conditional use um, under a site plan review, um, which would be with the planning board. Um, and you can notice that not all of the shorefront areas allow these uses. Goose Rocks, Cape Arundel, and Village Residential East, for example, do not permit these uses. Storage of repair, uh, storage and repair of fishing equipment is permitted in across town, and it's perhaps not as much of a water dependent use. So you can see a, a decent range of water dependent uses uh, boatyard, commercial marina, fish processing, uh, a marina, marine transportation services, and a ship chandlery, which I admittedly I had to look that up the first time I read that. Um, here we're back to our dimensional uh, table with um, a shift over to a short discussion on another land use, on another issue that came up during our growth planning committee meetings, and that is related to uh, dimensional standards, the maximum lot coverage. So you can see within each district there are requirements for the maximum lot coverage, and this is simply. Um, the percentage of the lot covered by structures or impervious surfaces, and we'll get into that nuance in a second. This graphic um, shows the maximum impervious surface area for the different zoning districts. Um, so I've listed them out here, forest and farm. Remember that's the district where you can have a lot size of up to um, three acres. Uh, there is less, a, a smaller percentage of that lot can be covered in impervious surfaces, 10%. For most of the zoning districts, the uh, the maximum is 20%. And then in Dock Square, where you have smaller districts, it's up to 70%. There's a slight difference um, between the lot coverage requirements if you're in the shoreland overlay zone, um, which is established basically to protect water resources and the surrounding uplands. Um, and that is that within the shoreland zone, lot coverage includes driveways, parking lots, and other non-vegetated surfaces, while areas that are not within the shoreland um, do not uh, require, for example, your driveway doesn't have to count as part of your lot coverage. Um, and so this, uh, this can result in uh, slightly different standards being applied in the same um, underlying zoning district. And um, the effect of having larger areas of impervious surfaces are that um, it can make drainage of surface water uh, more difficult uh, and cause more runoff. Um, and higher areas of uh, impervious areas and limits on lot coverage can allow larger homes, um, longer driveways to be built um, when they're not being counted towards that total impervious surface area. Um, and when redevelopment occurs, the new structure, um, as I think has been seen in Kenny Bunkport, can have a surprisingly larger footprint. The last slide that I'm going to show here before our polls is a slide that shows, um, you can focus on the pink areas here, and that is the extent of the sewer in Kenny Bunkport. So the Bright pink shows all of the individual parcels that are on town sewer. The black line is the sewer line. And then the shaded pink area shows uh, areas that could reasonably be connected to sewer um, because they are within a thousand feet from the sewer line. And we show this just to give you an idea of um, where the infrastructure, sewer infrastructure exists to support um, potential development um, that uh, relies on access to sewer. Um, these are also areas where um, you'd want to limit your septic system um, based, based on the proximity to some of your valuable marshes and coastal areas. So keep the sewer line in mind when we're thinking about development in different areas of town. With that, um, I am pulling up the polling instructions here, and I'll go through those instructions pretty quickly. We'll leave them on the screen for you, and Dave is going to pull up our first poll. 
So when the poll appears on the screen, uh, everyone that's participating tonight can um, click on your responses. Um, you'll see bubbles that you can um, use your mouse and click on uh, to indicate your response. You can change your response while the pool poll is still active um, up until you hit submit. You can also choose more than one option to the question that we have tonight in our polls. You might need to scroll down to see all of the response options. So um, don't forget to do that. And then after the poll session ends, you'll see the results right on your screen. Again, you may have to scroll through the results um, through the poll to see all of the results. When you're done viewing the poll response, make sure to close out of the box with the poll um, that if you leave that open, um, that might impact your ability to raise your hand and participate in the discussion. So if you're finding that you can't click on um, the hand raise function later on, just double check that you have closed your poll out. Um, you can also open up the poll again if you want to uh, jump back and see the results. So uh, Dave, if you don't mind queuing up our first poll, we'll take uh, a couple minutes for everyone to read through and um, respond to the polls. And it, you should see a poll pop up. It just popped up on my screen. If you don't, um, give us a shout. If anyone is only participating over the phone, I'll just read the question out. Uh, the question is, which of the following uses would you like to see more of in Kenny Bunkport? And we'll keep the questions and the we'll look at the responses up on our website so that you can see the results if you're only on by phone. Why doesn't everyone take about 30 more seconds? All right, thanks, Dave. Could you close the poll and display the results for us? Okay. Great, so I'll go through these really quickly before our discussion time. It looks like based on the responses, um, and again, people could choose more than one. Um, the most interest is seeing more small locally owned businesses that are geared primarily to serve local residents, followed by farmers markets and solar farms ranging in size from five to 10 acres. Uh, oh, sorry. I think it looks like specialty, um, small specialty food stores snuck in just ahead of solar farms. And it looks like there's not a lot of interest in industry or manufacturing um, and less interest in seeing office space, uh, conventional grocery stores um, or medical or healthcare. Um, so thank you for your results. Um, we'll save those and, um, and have those available on our project website. And we will use those when we're working on our strategies. So I am going to uh, exit out of my full screen mode for right now, just so I can see some more faces during our discussion. Um, this is the portion, our first discussion session for the evening, where we're going to invite folks to participate um, live, uh, either through the chat or um, through our, um, through the hand raise function. Um, and if all else fails, raise your actual hand um, or interrupt us. So um, let me see if I can just display one question at a time or a smaller version of this. Not in presentation mode. Okay, so it might be a little bit small for folks here. Let me just scroll through. Get to our questions. 
So I will do my best to moderate the hands in the audience. And Tom is going to uh, keep an eye on our chat box. And um, when we see comments or questions come in or hands raised, then we will call on you. And don't forget to unmute yourself. So our first question is, if you chose other in the poll, uh, what are some of the other uses that you would like to see? And I think we actually deleted that question from our poll. Um, so let's start over with that question. Are there additional uses that you would like to see in Kenny Bunkport that we didn't include on our list of um, uses throughout town? Um, okay, so let me see. It looks like Steve Turner. See your hand first. Thanks, Liz. Uh, I'd like to see uh, more moderate and entry-level housing. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, John Ripton? Line. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. I went through the development plan and I saw very little mention, of, if any, of trees and forest management, municipal forest management. And that is recognized now across the country as an essential part of an infrastructure in that it reduces pollutants into the uh, sewer system, into the streams and rivers, sequests CO2, leads to, uh, in, you know, in decreases the heating function, the heating factor in houses, saves energy costs and so forth, um, erosion in coastal areas. I mean, there are all kinds of, of benefits of trees. And yet, I know that we have a shade tree committee, I, I convene it, uh, and we do have a budget, but I would think you'd want to look at that as a part of the, the essential infrastructure and the planning, especially climate change planning. That's my Thank answer. you. Great, thanks. Any other comments or thoughts on uses that you would like to see in different areas of Kenny Bunkport? Are there any uses that you see that you don't think belong in certain areas of the town? Well, let's follow up on um, the comment we got, um, one of our comments from the first question on um, entry level housing. Are there specific areas of town that you would like to see uh, entry level housing that you think are appropriate for, for that type of housing? Steve, Stephen. Hi, um, just, I guess just outside the sewer line district setups. And I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't recall the exact names of the, the zones that were there, uh, but it would seem like it would be, you know, a feasible next step to extend sewer lines into those next zones. Thanks. We have, uh, we have several comments in the chat. Um, if you want to take a a lot about parks. Um, recently we did cover parks in our um, 
let's see our recreation chapter we talk about some of the municipal parks and we have covered the conservation land in the natural resources chapter and our uh, existing land use chapter but um, corridors is definitely an area that we could um, we could explore a little bit further and I guess I'm uh, curious about what areas of town you might recommend for uh, wildlife corridors or, or what connections Well, uh, Liz, it's, it's the nature of chat. We're not getting an immediate response. Um, okay. I, I do recall the natural resources chapter. Um, the quarters were, were addressed in that chapter, but we'll go back and look at that because mm -hmm. I think it's an excellent comment. Um, the next comment in chat is, I agree with the need for more moderate and entry level houses. And I think that somebody um, seconded Steve Turner's motion. Um, and then we have a comment that uses it bring the community together recreational facilities outdoor meeting space great thank you okay um how about thinking about um the best areas of town for um for non-residential development um so that would be businesses uh, office uh, potentially light industry, even though there's not a lot of interest tonight in seeing more industry, um, or mixed use development, which is a residential and um, typically a retail or office space um, in the same building or in the same lot. So are there areas that um, are best in town for those types of uses? And I guess I would, um, I would say consider um, you know, the existing development and, and also, uh, you know, if you were thinking about land uses from scratch in, in Kenny Bongport. Where's the, uh, the chat box is still quite lively. Shall I okay. um, we'll continue there? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Uh, in reference to the housing that was mentioned earlier, the question is, how will this type of housing be funded? Great question. Okay. Should we get through some of the other comments in the chat box? I don't uh, see too many more hands coming certainly, up. Certainly, yeah. Um, and the next one is, I agree with Nina, save space for wildlife. Um, next comment is, I like the idea of preserving open space and recreational facilities. Um, next comment up was, I was assuming a question about uh, development was not intended to include parks and recreational land, which might come under a different question. I don't consider those development, but perhaps I misunderstood. next comment has to do with housing as well uh, important not to put all entry level housing in one location if financially feasible should be scattered throughout the community and then the next comment also concerns housing please discuss how moderate income housing could be encouraged and limited to full-time residents not seasonal health uh, not seasonal housing mm -hmm. um, that one's more challenging mm -hmm. Uh, next comment, close to the highway systems and in designated business parks, office space, at least currently, is less important. Yeah. Next comment is, it would be helpful to see the land map again. I believe it's a reference to the zoning map. And then the next comment is, I agree with Carol. Carol was commenting upon putting the, uh, making sure the, all the entry Level housing is not in one place. Next comment is agree to save open space woods and limit the development of mega mansions and focus on middle, lower income, full-time families. And the final comment that's come up so far is with uh, Kenny Bunport Conservation Trust owning 20% of acreage, does the town need more space for wildlife and trails? And that's a question. Yeah. Great. 
Thanks, Tom, for for um, for reading through all of those questions, um, and thanks everyone for submitting them in the chat. That's great. Um, we are um, we're not going to be able to get through all of the questions. Um, and uh, at the moment right now, um, but we are going to dive into some of the housing questions, I think, a little bit in the next presentation. Um, but great thoughts on um, the open space. We'll, we'll make sure that we're really highlighting um, the important rec areas, um, the corridors in, you know, in different chapters of the plan. Um, and we do have um, a fair amount of thinking to do in terms of the strategies that we're going to recommend in and for inclusion in the plan. Um, and I say we meaning the growth planning committee um, with respect to housing, because that is a big issue um, that um, the committee has been talking a lot about um, the need for more affordable housing and for for different types of housing options um, and the seasonal versus year round resident discussion um, has come up in um, and uh, the growth planning committee meetings as well as our past workshop. Um, Lucy, we have another question in the chat. Okay. And keep this slide on because that's going to help answer the question. Um, what is the farm and forest and free enterprise zones currently and who, what organizations own this land? Okay, so those the the the, um, the, dis the districts are those areas that are shown in the dark green and the um, kind of lime green on the map on the screen, and they are owned by a variety of uh, different entities. So they don't show land ownership; they just show the town zone, uh, zoning. Um, so some of the land is owned by the town. Some is owned by. The conservation trust um and then uh a lot of the land is privately owned by um different entities werner did i see your hand come up uh yes uh you know i offered to jump in there but uh, i think he answered you know that question well is so okay. thank you and now we have another comment list we don't want okay. you to be bored there um i, I agree with uh, carol arley regarding wildlife and trails if it's not kept wild and natural it will sooner or later be developed okay we do have um maps in uh a couple of the chapters of the plan that show um the conserved land so the amount that it's the land that is um permanently protected from development as well as um, town-owned land that's not likely to be developed. Um, some of the town forest area, um, which is a smaller area in the northern part of town. Um, a lot of the town-owned conservation land um, is now owned by the Conservation Trust. But we do have some maps showing the, that area in um, our natural resources and our existing uh, land use chapters and the future land use chapter um, has some draft maps currently um, that combine a lot of the information that we have available um, through the GIS, the geographic information systems on different types of uh, natural land use. So wetlands, um, uh, habitats of endangered or uh, threatened species, um, specific habitats that are rare, uh, wetlands, floodplains, and other critical land areas. And this information does get incorporated into um, the conceptual future land uses, land use maps that does show um, uh, areas that should and shouldn't be targeted for development. So I'd encourage everyone to take a look at those um, those materials. We didn't have time to present on all of that tonight. Um, we're coming up on our deadline for this first presentation piece. So I'm going to take a question. I see Edward Hutchins has a hand raised, and then we'll try to wrap up. We have two more comments. Two more questions in the chat also. OK. All right. Oh. Am I up? Sure. Yep. All right. Um, I. As far as describing town-owned land, I'm on the board of selectmen, 
and we have discussed this, um, I would not say it, it is wrong for anybody to say that that land is not possibly developable and developable in the future. So I think everybody should be aware of that. I am not in favor of it, but we have been approached by people um, who would like to develop land in the town. And while I have no plans to allow that to happen, there are those out there who would like to see it. So I think everybody in the audience tonight should be aware of that. Thanks for that yeah. clarification. And I, um, yeah, I apologize if I um, confused that. We, so we have our conservation um, data layer has town owned lands um, included in that conservation layer, some of the conservation layers. Um, and some of that land has, uh, you know, structures like the school or a police station, um, which are um, not likely to be developed in another way. Um, and and that, that was my intent there, uh, not to say that, that all town-owned land can't be developed. Well, you mentioned the town forest, and it is only a forest in name only. Uh, unfortunately, it, that does not offer protection uh, for that land from development. Mm -hmm. You know, now any of this land, unless okay, it's well, and acquired, I thank you for that clarification. Okay. I I was under the impression that this part of the town forest had been um, transferred to the land trust, but I um, will we'll, we'll make sure we have our language correct on that, and I uh, appreciate. The correction. You're welcome. Thanks. So we had two comments, Tom. Do you want to um, sure. throw those quickly? Yeah, and then, yeah they're, um, they're questions. Um, one is about sustainable carrying capacity. It is a tool for environmental management and defined as the growth limits that an area can accommodate without violating environmental capacity loads. This includes tourist carrying capacity. Are you familiar with such studies and would this kind of study be valuable for planning future use and potential densities that could impact the various natural resources that we value in Gayport? Well, um, we, we certainly have been talking about tourist carrying capacity in the last several meetings of the Growth Planning Committee. Um, and, and that included the joint meeting with the planning board. So it is on our radar screen. Um, and then it's certainly a, a valid um, approach to, to uh, comprehensive planning. And we'll, we'll take that question into account. Um, next, next comment, next question is, um, will, will a plan for the village parcel be part of the comprehensive plan? I was uh, wondering myself, what's the town's next move in terms of the village parcel? I was hoping to catch up with some town officials to, to see where that one is going. That's an excellent question. Um, and, uh, and the next comment is somebody else saying, great question <laughs> about the village parcel. And then the final comment is, uh, I do not think the village parcel planning should be automatically included in our comprehensive plan. So, uh, we're going to, we're going to have to sort that one out. Thanks, so. Uh, Dan. Well, I, th I think, uh, I think Ed was ahead of me. Okay. Yeah, so let Ed go first. Uh, sure. Ed. Yeah, I was just, uh, uh, David Kling drew attention to the Kennebunkport Heritage Housing Trust for just, I guess, informative uh, value on talking about the affordable housing. Um, I wasn't familiar with the, the Heritage Housing Trust. I'm just a resident uh, and, and it was one of my early meetings. So. If somebody could add some, shed some light on exactly what that Heritage Housing Trust is and why Dave's drawing our attention to that. We, we are planning to address that in about 15 minutes, Ed. Okay, good. Very good. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Dan, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, I, I just uh, wanted to comment that uh, we really appreciate uh, from the board uh, all the comments and questions, and though we can't really answer all those this evening because of the nature of this process, please don't hesitate to keep throwing them out there because we will use those as part of our discussions and planning and make sure that you're aware when those topics are coming up in our, our meetings through our agenda. So I just wanted to thank you for doing that and please continue to do so even if we don't specifically answer the question you ask. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. 
Um, thanks everyone. Great questions. Um, and we're going to move on to our next presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Tom is going to pull his up. How's that look? Can you guys see it? Can you, um, make it a little bit bigger, Tom? Yeah, I sure can. Let's see. Um, How's that? It hasn't changed on my end yet. Really? It's fine on mine. Oh, maybe it's just me. Is it, is it should look pretty big right now. Does everybody see it as big or is it still an issue? Yeah, that's good. In here, an issue. You should be able to make it bigger. Oh, it's taking up my whole screen. I'm not sure why it's not. Um, Yeah, I think it's a Mac issue. Uh, is there a presentation view option in uh, in the PDF? Um, that looks that looks bigger. Yeah, you got it. You Excellent. Got it. Yeah, I just did the wrong order. Apparently, it's kind of finicky. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, residential development trends uh, and as everybody knows, the uh, the housing market has been quite lively. Uh, in Kenny Bunkport and all over the United States since the pandemic began. Uh, but first, we're going to uh, take advantage of some work the town already did in the recent past. When the town hired some consultants to master plan for the village parcel, um, part of that package included some uh, a company out of New York called Camoin that uh, specializes in housing and, and market uh, analyses relative to the housing. And their, their numbers are actually more comprehensive than what you'd find in the U.S. Census and the usual sources. So uh, I think I think they're very informative for this discussion. And it's also, it's a fairly recent uh, collection of data. They, they published their report in July of last year. And they made a number of uh, general findings about Kenny Bunkport that um, distinguish the town from, from others. Uh, it says that... Um, because it's a very popular town for second homeowners and seasonal residents, that's putting a lot of pressure on the housing market and driving up costs. Also noted that uh, the town of Canyon Court is becoming wealthier and older over time. The median age is 55 and a half, um, the highest in the region. And, and um, you know, that's even high for Maine. Maine is, uh, Maine is one of the highest in the nations. Um, the average household size is 2.19. That's consistent with uh, many houses being occupied by um, uh, older people, at least not young families. And it's the second low, lowest household size in um, the region. By region, they um, combined to find uh, much of York County, the immediate towns, in about a 10 mile radius in every direction. Um, they also noticed that. Um, only 14% of Kinneybunk Court's households are family age, families that are, are starting families and have young children and children in the school system. And 42% are senior. And in the United States, it's these two cohorts are generally about the same. So Kinneybunk Court is, is, uh, has a different um, generational balance than, than the, uh, the, the nation at least. Um, the growth of housing stock has remained fairly steady. We have a um, uh, growth permit uh, system in place in the land use ordinance that limits the number of permits can be issued each year. Uh, Warren, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think you don't actually hit the limit, uh, at least not in the last 10 years. The limit is 40 per year. And um, by numbers I was able to track, the town is issuing about 21 permits on average per year. Um, and it's not dipping or, or jumping around. It's pretty much of a straight straight line increase there. Uh, population since the last census grew 4%, housing stock grew 7%, and 55% um, of the uh, housing units were occupied on April 1st when the U.S. Census comes around. That's not an arbitrary date. That's when the census counts things. Um, so that, that does mean that there are a lot of houses in Kinneybunk Court that were empty on April 1st, and then those are mostly seasonal residents. And um, 
the, the issuance of permits are, are uh, a little complicated the way it is in the land use ordinance, but they basically have a limit for each of three zones in town. And, and um, you, you may recall when Liz showed the uh, sewer map, it, it depicted those three zones. Um, the, 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 the one zone is um, targeted for growth. One is targeted for rural, I mean, they don't want to see a lot of houses in the rural area. And the other is transitional, that's somewhere in between. Uh, the growth generally aligns with the sewer system. The rural is generally outside the sewer system. Um, you can see over the last, since 2013, the numbers have been bouncing around from year to year, but there is one consistent trend, and that is, look at 2013 and the aqua. Follow the aqua, as you can see, as time goes on, the aqua numbers get a little bit higher. They're edging up, and that is the, that is the number of rural, um, number of permits issued in the rural zone outside the sewer district. Um, in Kenny Bunport, the housing stock is skewered toward home ownership. It's it's a higher percentage in the region, which is only 68% in town. It's 83%. And you have a high percentage of seasonal homes, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, Kim Owen found 40%. The U.S. Census as of April 2020 was up around 45%. So there's a little discrepancy there, but that's still a lot. Um, and these are your uh, early 2020 home prices. So we know these are these probably kind of the yesterday's and those. But uh, at that time, the median home value was nearly half a million dollars in Kenny Bunkport, which was twice what the region was doing at that time. Um, and in Kenny Bunkport, the sales prices were typically 300,000 higher than in Kenny Bunk and 400,000 higher than in the rest of York County. Um, now, we know also that the real estate market's been pretty hot since then, so these, these numbers are, are already um, out of date. The Southern Maine um, Planning and Development Commission periodically tracks what they call an affordability index, and that's where they compare uh, the median income in the region with the median uh, home price in a particular town. And they do this for every town in York County. Um, and what you see here are the uh, charts of the, the, the most unaffordable towns in the county for six different time periods since the year 2000. And Kenny Port has made the list five out of these six times. The most recent one is uh, 2020. I don't know if you can see my little uh, cursor here, but um, at that time, Lagunquit was the least affordable town um, with an index of 0.47. And Kenny Port was just behind. What this 0.52 means is that somebody wanted to buy a house in Kenny Port, they would have to make twice the median income of York County. Um, so that, that's kind of a uh, high bar to, uh, to, to get over. What, you, what would be ideal is if your index was one. And these, of course, are the, 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 the communities that are, that are uh, well under one. Uh, Kamoin found that there's a uh, Demand for housing in Kenny Bunkport is unusual because it's being driven by people from outside the region, seasonal residents and retirees who are moving here. And it's kind of disconnected from the local economy in Southern Maine, uh, which is unusual. And um, obviously stating the obvious is when there's a high demand and a limited supply, it's gonna drive the price right up. And that's a problem for people in the local workforce who, you know, who, we're not able to uh, come up with the, the money to, to enter the housing market. Oops, I skipped one. Okay, and here, of course, um, I think we're all aware that uh, since the pandemic um, began, the, the there's a lot of people fleeing the cities. They got kind of spooked by the virus, and they're rushing out to the country, not just in Maine, but all over the place. But certainly, Kitty Bunkport is an attractive place to, to hide out for a while. And that, that really pushed the uh, housing prices right up. Rentals, 17% of the town's housing stock are rentals. Um, year round, a very limited number. Uh, back when Camoin did their study um, a year ago, the, the median rent was $1,015 in town. I'm not sure that's still the case. And uh, in other parts of the county, um, there um, new units were constructed in the region for, for rentals, but not in Kennebuck Park. Um, and Kamoin also found that nine out of 10 new households in 65 and older cohort 
are people from outside the region, not not people locally who are just getting older and surpassing age 65. These are people moving from, from pretty far away. And um, Ed, was this your question or somebody was asking about the uh, the Kenny Book Point housing? Yeah, that, uh, I was dittoing what David Kling introduced in there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I'm impressed with this effort. Um, you know, there's some, some folks in town took this issue seriously, and they established a nonprofit um, back in 2018 to, uh, you know, see if they can at least make a dent in the problem, and they, and they are. Um, and they're, they're making good progress. Now, even if they meet their goal, they're going to be um, well under what, what Kamoyne says that, you know, reflects demand in the area, but you know, I, my hats off to this group. There, they have done a lot of hard work, and they are succeeding. Their goal is to um, to construct 25 affordable units by 2025, and uh, last I checked, they are on track to meet the goal. These are some uh, architects' renditions of what some of the units will look like. So that's that's one part of the solution, and it's it's locally grown here. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, another thing we've got to keep in mind is, is migration. I mentioned that a moment ago. Um, in, in Liz and I, in, in our line of work, we, you know, we try to anticipate what's coming around the corner next so that the community can start to prepare. Um, and, and migration is, is one of the themes that you know, we've, been, we've been paying attention to. What we've seen evidence, of course, was the migration that was driven by the uh, the, uh, the virus since since March of 2020. It's driven a lot of people into the countryside and had a, had a great impact on the housing market. Uh, but the, the migration in the, in the future, maybe the next 20, 10 to 20 years, could be coming from other parts of the United States. And uh, I look in my crystal ball, actually I just read the New York Times, and I see that you know, Colorado River is in crisis, and that supplies water to 40 million people. So the Southwest has their hands full in, in uh, trying to ensure that people have um, you know enough, enough as much water as they need. That that could be really problematic, and it could really cause people to leave the Southwest, go into some other region in the United States where uh, water supply is not an issue. Of course, Maine fits the bill perfectly. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see some migrants from that part of the country in the next 10 years or so. Uh, another issue down in the Gulf Coast, they're seeing a lot of rain and hurricanes and storms. Uh, this is a, uh, an article from the Washington Post saying, you know, how did Houston get hit with three 500 year storms three years in a row? How is this possible? Well, the answer, the short answer is climate change. And, and the, the takeaway is it's not gonna change anytime soon. And uh, we know people are going to be leaving that. They're, they're just going, they're going to have to, to get flooded enough. They're, they're going to start to, to find a place that doesn't flood so much. And once again, Maine, uh, Maine is looking pretty good. And then there's, uh, then there's the wildfires that burn across the, the, the West, particularly in California. Uh, what, what I found particularly alarming is, is the, the scientists are studying the impact of the wildfire smoke on young children, and it's not good news. You know, if uh, I think a lot of young families out in the wildfire zone are going to really think twice about staying there, and they'll be looking for a place that does not have air quality issues. They don't want to have to raise their young children in an toxic environment. So once again, Maine, Maine is looking pretty attractive. Um, I'd like to shift gears for a moment and look at some of the development patterns that we've seen in town for the last 50 years. Um, well, actually goes back a lot further, as you know, but uh, on, on the left, is, uh, we have an aerial photograph of, of the village area down near Dock Square. And one thing I'd like to point out is, is all the streets are connected to each other. You can kind of walk this way and that way and change your route. If, you, if you're a walker, you can change your, your, your route you know, each day and see different scenery. Um, and then in other parts of town, particularly up in the northern part, you, you see a lot of um, dead end streets, cul-de-sacs. Um, this vinical uh, uh, lane I'm using as an example here, I wish I could have more current photo, but I couldn't find one. It actually has some houses on it now, but it's a recent subdivision and it's a cul-de-sac. And I guess the question I want to raise to get you all thinking about it, are, are these dead end streets, um, is this is this desirable? Is this um, what you want to see in the future? Because that's what's been going on for the last 50 years. 
I know my own preference is is connected streets because I think it's it's better for 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 the community. People tend to to interact more. It's, it, it strengthens community bonds when when people are running into each other in a, in a, in a neighborhood like the village, as opposed to these um, isolated uh, areas of town. Now, obviously, a lot of people like living in a dead end street, and I, I can understand why. But um, it's just just a topic that I'd like to throw out there just to get people thinking about it. And another hot topic is density. Um, and I'm sure that's going to uh, generate some opinions. Not all will agree with each other, but I'd like to start by showing what's out there. We call a spectrum, you know, from low to high and what that looks like and some of the advantages and disadvantages. And uh, from low, we're going to start by looking at Spruce Avenue and Guinea Buckport. And this was a subdivision that was uh, in conformance with the zoning ordinance. And what the ordinance required up here was um, three of the zoning minimum, as Liz referenced a few minutes back. And that means if you want to put a house up in this part of town, you have to start with a lot that's at least three acres in size. Uh, Spruce Avenue, they actually range from three acres to four and a half. Um, and this is an example of low density. In a moment, we'll discuss, you know, the pros and cons of low density. Uh, next up in the spectrum is, I, I like this illustration. This is courtesy of the uh, consultants who prepared the master plan for the village parcel. And what they did, maybe on purpose, maybe uh, inadvertently, is they juxtaposed um, two different types of residential development. Down in the lower part is Squire Lane. That already exists. And those are one acre lots, some of them a little larger than one acre. This is like one and a half, I believe, and this one's one. Um, and for the village parcel itself, they try to envision a more dense developed community. And there were reasons for that. They, they're trying to create a village feel. Uh, they're trying to make it a more uh, social area, but they're also trying to bring down the cost of building a house, because that's one of the main drivers is the price of land. If you, if you require large lots in your zoning ordinance, that's automatically going to send your housing prices up a few notches. But um, I like this illustration because it shows the two different um, uh, approaches to, to uh, residential development. And it's also in Kenny Bunkport. Uh, now we leave Kenny Bunkport because some examples of density just don't exist in Guinea Bunkport, so I have to go elsewhere in the United States. This is Minneapolis. Minneapolis made the headlines a year ago by um, doing something very kind of controversial and radical. The city council voted to abolish single family zoning. Now, what that means is that if you had this house in the middle, you could uh, convert it into duplex or triplex without asking any extra permission from the city of Minneapolis. Um, uh, we're going to point it out that you can actually do that in most parts of Kenny Bunkport. But the difference is the house we're looking at here is only about 15, 20 feet away from their neighbors. And it's not very far from, from the, uh, the, the public way. Uh, so this is, this is on a much smaller lot. And, you know, this is probably a quarter acre, whereas in Kenny Bunkport, you could go duplex or triplex, but you're already starting from a very large lot to begin with, and that's the difference. And then uh, Cape Corpus, that, um, I don't know anybody who doesn't like Cape Corpus. Um, the master plan consultants for the village parcel did a poll back in 2019 and it says, what are your favorite streets and neighborhoods in town? And Dock Square, Cape Corpus, uh, as you can see the results of the poll down here in the, in the lower right, they, they came out way ahead of everybody else. This picture you can tell by the car over on the left side of the photographs is probably taken in the 1930s, perhaps a little later. Um, but I guess one point I'd like to mention is this predates zoning. Um, and that, that if you wanted to rebuild Cape Corpus to look just like this, you could not do it under the present zoning ordinance. The present zoning ordinance is more suburban oriented. And you know people are saying, well, we like the New England traditional character. Um, but the zoning has kind of been pushing the town in a different direction for the last, um, I guess how many years it's been in effect, 60 years. Um, and I, I think people inadvertently bought into a suburban blueprint back in 1960 without realizing it because they say, look at Cape Corpus, we love Cape Corpus, but then you compare it to your land use ordinance and you say, well, there's a little disconnect there. So what are we gonna do about that? Then the, uh, on the density spectrum, we're going a little higher here. 
This is Portsmouth. Uh, it's just outside of the city center. This street was laid out in 1805. And this is an example of um, uh, density. It's a little bit higher than you see in, in, in the village of Kinnebuckport. Uh, the little house in the middle is actually only on one twentieth of an acre, but it's a, it has a fair amount of space inside and behind. The houses on the left and the right are uh, both like one point four acres. Um, two, two houses on the right, the yellow and the white, are single family. This one on the left was converted in the nineteen seventies to five uh, one bedroom apartments. So this is this is what uh, density looks like. So I, I show this because when people just look at the numbers or hear the numbers, they say, "Oh my God, we can't do that. That's too dense." But um, this is what it looks like in the real world. So I think it's less scary when you actually see a picture of what's out there. And then uh, at the very top of the spectrum, again, we have an example from Portsmouth. Uh, Portsmouth has a crisis in finding housing for its restaurant workers. The city has close to 200 restaurants and now they have a severe labor shortage and the developers before the city boards right now proposing 46 high density units, most of them no larger than the size of a college dormitory room. Um, and I expect this will probably get final approval from the city in a couple of weeks. But you've got 46 units on one quarter of an acre. So that's very high density. This is the what the building is there now. It's called the Captain Treadwell House, built in 1818. It's comparable to what you see down near Dock Square. And in the, in the diagram up here, the Treadwell House is on the left, and everything else is, is um, new construction, will be new construction. So that's, that's my little tour of the density spectrum from high to low. And um, some strategies I'll throw out there just to generate some conversation on density and residential patterns of developments. Um, do we want to reduce the lot size, um, lot width, and setbacks? And, and that, that's a wide open question. It could be all over town. It could just be certain parts of town. Um, do we want to allow uh, residential mixed use in more zoning districts? Personally, it's, it's permitted in five of your 11 zoning districts. And tiny houses, we have no idea how well that would play in Kitty Buckport. So I'd like to hear some, some audience reaction to that. And um, is everybody familiar with tiny houses? They're not much bigger than a tool shed, but they're starting to, to catch on in popularity in some places in the United States. So we're ready for a poll again. Dave, if you could, could uh, um, serve up our first poll. And Liz, I can see there's a few comments in the chat box already. There are a few comments. Um, cool. While we get the poll queued up, I'll just review a couple that have come in um, recently. Um, a couple on um, carrying capacity, sustainable carrying capacity. I think that we we touched on that. Um, and I do just want to take a moment to say I, I misunderstood someone's last comment about development and in just encouraging, uh, including built sort of built environment uses um, like commercial or residential. That was sort of the intention. We haven't explicitly tried to include um, natural resources or natural resource protection from this discussion. We just have limited time. And so we're focusing more on um, certain types of development, but I encourage everyone to check out the natural resources, water resources and land use chapters um, because we do pay quite a bit of attention to the important natural resources. Um, that being said, keep the comments coming because there's a lot of new ideas that we can incorporate into those chapters too. So I'm going to be quiet while this pulls up so everyone can read okay. through there. You guys are all experienced pollsters now, so you know what to do. We will leave this up for about a minute while you make up your minds. It's almost as good as mail-in voting, huh? Mm -hmm. Does anybody need more time with the poll? All right, we have a fairly simple uh, question there. So I think everybody's had a chance to, uh, to answer. Dave, Tom looks you... like he might be frozen over there. So- um... What's frozen? Oh, he's- 
Sorry, maybe maybe I might, I was frozen. I thought you were frozen. Okay. Does anybody need more time in the poll? Okay. Could you uh, close the poll and and show us the results? Okay. Once again, we get some winners and losers. Small homers, small homes scored well as did rentals long term. Summer rentals not so well. Um, I'd be curious uh, when we get into discussion what what um, the folks who check other what they were referring to. So um, I guess we'd like to get the uh, discussion underway. Maybe Liz, you can, you can start off by um, catching us up on what some of the comments were. Unit. We had a uh, one comment, um, is that a housing stock issue? Um, Steve Turner, um, if you don't mind, maybe typing your question with a little more context, just because I'm not sure exactly when that came in, um, what point of the discussion. We have another comment. Um, I would like to see more focus on how to make sure long-term locals are not taxed out. Uh, parcel ownership, um, which gets at that question a little bit um, offhand. I'm not sure we know the answer to that question. Another comment, suburban style zoning is what has created sprawl. Another comment came in, yes, if we want to include affordable housing and protect habitat for wildlife and recreation, we have to think uh, a bit differently. The design of quote, larger homes should be greater than three bedrooms. A three bedroom house is the right size for many families. Uh, in other, I would include affordable housing for low and middle income households um, and agree with Tracy larger than three or three and smaller is a better split. Thanks for all those comments. Um, that's the chat box there, Tom. All right. I was just going to add that um, in terms of the, the comment or the question about um, being taxed out of Kennebunkport, that's one of my concerns when I'm, I'm anticipating what the impact of migration will be on town. Because um, that's, I think that'll be one of the, the you know, um, the big drivers when, when all these people are coming from far away to escape climate change and they come to Kennebunkport. Um, the ones with money will get what they want and that's going to that's going to be tough for the um, um, some of the local people that hang in there. So that, that's a concern of mine. So um, discussion, uh, the intergenerational balance is skewing toward the elderly at the expense of young families. Is this the problem? Um, if so, what can be done to restore the balance? So that's a question I'll just throw out to, uh, to the uh, participants. Looks like Werner had his hand up, but maybe before that question came out. Werner? Uh, no, I just, I saw a couple of uh, questions that were there in the chat that uh, that was looked like they were looking for some input from me. Uh, and I think there was a question in there that dealt with, um, you know, the seasonality, you know, as far as the percentage of demographic that is seasonal. Uh, you know, and I think the number that got quoted there was 47%. Um, you know, I, I don't have current data, you know, but I do think, you know, generally speaking, the trend has continued uh, to trend upward, you know, in the sense that that seasonal demographic, you know, continues to increase, uh, you know, in terms of percentage of, uh, of percentage of residents. Uh, and there's also kind of on that same theme, there was a question relative to, you know, the, you know, the ownership uh, within Binnacle Hill. And I think what, uh, with any type of development, what I would, uh, what I would tell folks just to remember is that oftentimes on our tax records, 
you know, the first uh, ownership information that you see is from where folks uh, currently are, are living in terms of that's where the tax bill is being sent. And so oftentimes in new development, you know, they're still having a tax bill, you know, being sent to another home somewhere else uh, where they currently reside. And so that type of data, I think is best, you know, is best reviewed after it's, you know, after you've been given a year, you know, to see whether or not that transitions into a year round residence or not, or if it continues, if you continue to see, you know, uh, you know, a preferred mailing address going to, uh, you know, some out of, of town location. Uh, other question was, you know, was asking about uh, permits for new homes. I mean, we do track those through our growth permit numbers. Uh, you know, what we saw last year was we saw 28 new home, or growth permits that were issued last year. Uh, obviously this year, you know, the year's not over yet, uh, but, uh, you know, based on my memory, uh, we are trending at a higher number this year. Uh, but I think, uh, Tom, you mentioned kind of the average over the past, uh, you know, what do we have 10 years or so tended in, into the, you know, mid to mid to high twenties is what we were seeing, um, you know, trending over the past, you know, 10 years. Um, so yeah, this year I do believe we're probably going to wind up, you know, being in the, you know, probably being in the mid thirties range. Um, if not, you know, if not coming close to hitting the 40 cap. Thank you, Werner. Tracy, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And I, I think for me, this is such a core issue for a comprehensive plan that if we do not deal with it, it's going to haunt us for the next 10 years. This being? This, I was just going to explain. So this being the thing that Warner is talking about, which is we are allowing people to build houses. We don't know going into it whether they are building it as an investment or as a um, seasonal home that they only plan to be here. You know, uh, in many cases, maybe they plan to be here for a month out of the year and otherwise it will sit vacant and or be Airbnb or rented in some other uh, contingency fashion. And for me, when you start to look at what is the systemic issue that we're facing with that, is that we are allowing that to happen without any, any inside input or control uh, from the town. And so I guess I would just say, I, I, I would like to have the growth um, planning committee think about this issue because it is the fundamental thing that is causing all of these problems that we're touching on, right? It's causing the uh, property values to continue to, to go up and up, which affects the uh, issue that Robin raised in terms of being taxed out. The main thing that's driving people's tax bills is the increasing valuations that are, you know, you might own a, a cape in Goose Rocks and that valuation is going up because of all of the development that's happening, for example, elsewhere in the town driving up the property values. So all of that is, is so, um, systemic in, in the issue that we, I think we really, really have to think about how we want to deal with that. And then also the, the step back I would say is from the perspective of planning, zoning and land use also then how that um, relates. So for example, if I'm coming from New York and I want a seasonal home, I want a binnacle hill, right? I want to, I want a big house up on a hill looking over the ocean. That is what I'm looking for. And I think if we think about that in the context of the zoning and the planning for the land use, we can say, gee, if we want more town-centric family neighborhoods, maybe we don't uh, allow more development out in the, you know, cul-de-sacs out in the in the um, you know mega mansion kind of areas. And I think I, I just want to lay that out there because I think it's such a fundamental core issue that if we gloss over it, we're going to be kicking ourselves for the next ten years. So that's my two cents. Okay. Excellent two cents. We've got a couple more comments, Tom, if you'd like me to read those. Fire away. Um, so let's see. Um, I would include affordable housing for low and middle income households. Um, oh, I already read that one. Um, at the last planning session, the most circle stickers, we did a sticky, but sticky dot poll um, were on not over development. Why has this not been discussed? It came up during Tom's slides about small population size home and not many workers living in town. If there were more starter slash tiny homes, then we could have workers, young families living in town. 
Love the possibility of tiny homes. May and Congress passed tiny home provision earlier this year. Good, good comments. I guess I'd share this thought in, in terms of um, preserving the open space. Uh, if you, when you look into the, the question about what's the appropriate lot size, um, you know, I mentioned they had three acres up in the north part of town. Um, maybe, maybe we should, you know, have another look at that. Maybe three acres isn't um, taking us where we want to go. Because I've heard two general themes. One is people are concerned with not pricing people out of town, and the other one is preserving the nature. And um, I think those are two very important goals. And, and they neither one of them seem to be served well by the three-acre minimum lot size approach. So that's something I think the Growth Planning Committee could could be looking into. I don't, um, I don't see everybody on my screen, so there could be some hands going up that I don't see. Um, uh, Tracy has a hand up. That was just a leftover hand, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> leftover hand. Okay, well, I can do a couple more comments. Okay. So let's see. Um, don't the homeowners at Binnacle Hill pay taxes like everyone else? How do you control what a homeowner does with their house? How can we improve access to the town hall and post post office in summertime? Would it work to move town hall and the post office to village parcel? Aren't you trying to grow the tax base? It's a question. And um, I'm all for smaller lot sizes. So some great comments and questions there. I would say we have maybe a couple of minutes to wrap up before we should move to our next um, discussion topic. A couple more comments coming in. How about instead of demolishing perfectly good homes, the town buys them and turns them into affordable housing? Um, village parcel has no road sewer, et cetera. The city owns other land with all these improvements. I think that's may maybe in reference to um, relocating the town hall and post office there. So um, great input. Thanks everyone for all of these points. And again, we're sorry we don't have time to get into a lot of detailed discussion on these topics now, but, um, but we'll definitely be revisiting these topics uh, during our growth planning committee meetings. And I hope that we see some new faces at those meetings too. Sea level rise, you guys ready to talk about uh, what's going to happen in the ocean? The impact on the uh, coast of Maine in the coming years. Um, uh, this, this chart here is, is produced by the Maine Climate Council. It was published in um, December of 2020. So it's, it's the latest projections by a reliable source in the state of Maine. And um, you can, I'm going to, I zoom a little bit. The uh, the state is is uh, looking at uh, four different scenarios um, because the scientists know that the water is coming up. They just can't tell us how fast and, and how high. So they've they've given us a range of possibilities, um, and they're pretty comfortable with the range. Um, but as time goes on, the the, the range is going to get narrower as they learn more about climate change and, and what to expect. Um, the so you can see on the chart on the right, the, the, the red dashed line is, is the worst case scenario. That's going to, it says that the ocean is going to go up 8.8 .8 feet at the end of the century. Um, the best case scenario is down at the bottom, the light blue line, that's 1.6. And then there's a couple in between. Um, the state's advising most municipalities to look at the intermediate, intermediate scenario, the green one. Uh, it's kind of a compromise position. And to, to plan for that, and and if you if you accept it, let, okay, let's plan our community around the intermediate scenario. That means we should expect one and a half feet of sea level rise by 2050, mid-century, and 3.9 feet by the end of the century. Um, now that said, they say if you have some critical infrastructure, such as you know a, a sewer system in your town, it's close to the ocean, you better. Um, be a little more careful of that because if that gets flooded, you're, you're in big trouble. And so they say that by the end of the century, for critical infrastructure, you should consider 
planning for 8.8 feet, or the high level. Let's see. Okay. And uh, here's, a, here's a map with a couple of inserts that show um, what parts of town will be inundated eventually um, by sea level rise. Like I said, we don't know exactly how fast this is going to happen, but it will happen. And you can see the, the, uh, the, the legend over on the left. Um, HAT stands for highest astronomical tide. That's basically the highest tide you're going to see in a 19 year period. So that's a pretty high tide. And that's blue on the maps. Yellow is what 1.6 feet of sea level rise looks like at that high tide. And what parts of town will be, be underwater with that event. Um, the, the orange color there, the light orange, is high tide plus 3.9 feet. You remember that's in the, the state is projecting that's how how high the ocean will rise by the end of the century under the intermediate scenario. And then the purple is the worst case scenario, 8.8 .8 feet at the end of the century. And this shows you um, what parts of town will be um, hit during various scenarios. We just don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but it will happen eventually. And this next, uh, whoops, I'm jumping around here. Computer is jumping. This, uh, this is more of the same theme, what parts of town are going to be inundated, but what we're looking at here is it has uh, presents data in a little different way. At the top, the top map shows 1.6 feet of sea level rise at the middle of the century. It's close to what the state is predicting. Um, and we've calculated that that's going to put 947 acres underwater in Guinea Port. Uh, when the uh, sea rises to 3.9 uh, feet, which the state's predicting will happen at the end of the century, you're going to have 1,288 uh, acres inundated. And if we get the worst case scenario, 8.8 uh, .8 feet, that's going to um, put 1,853 acres underwater. And, and the map shows you what parts of town and where they are. As you can see, in the 8.8 .8 feet, uh, all of Goose Rocks Beach is underwater at high tide, perhaps even at low tide. Uh, this is some of your infrastructure you got to keep an eye on. The town's done an uh, exceptionally good job at get, staying ahead of the game. So we're looking at a map of the, the sewer system, um, and, and the different colors represent different what are called sewer sheds. And the sewer shed, let's just go up by, by Mill Lane, for example, as an example. This orange up here. All the houses in the orange, they all uh, um, rely on this sewer pump at, at Mill Lane, and the sewer pump pumps the effluent over to the sewer treatment plant, the wastewater plant here. You all know where that is. That's near the uh, the school and the, and the rec center. Um, so each each color is a different neighborhood. It's relying on a different pump. Um, where it gets kind of tricky is that um, some of the pumps are at relatively low elevations, particularly out in the the eastern part of town. Uh, it's because, you know, for example, we're looking at Goose Rocks Beach. Goose Rocks is at a low elevation, so obviously the pumps are low, too. And uh, the problem is, as, as the sea rises, uh, the pumps could be threatened. And, um, you know, the pumps are pretty rugged, but um, they'll, they'll, they'll withstand a lot of punishment. What you don't want to have happen is that for the water to get so high that it hits the electrical panel or the backup generator, because then, then it will fail. And if it fails... Um, all these people, they're they're going to have problems because their their plumbing will no longer work, and that's going to be very unpleasant. So that's something you want to keep an eye on. I got to say, Katie McCord's doing a really good job at that, um, but just keep an eye out on that for the future because uh, it's going to cost some money to to protect the sewer system from climate change. Uh, some of the roadways are going to be vulnerable as well, too. The picture on the top left is uh, Pier Road after the blizzard of 1978. Uh, Pier Road is seven feet above sea level. The town in the next few years is going to um, rebuild Pier Road. And when they do, they're going to make it a little bit wider so they accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists, but they're also going to raise it four feet higher uh, to, to, so it doesn't become a victim of um, sea level rise prematurely. So that they're going to, it's going to cost a few bucks, probably a million dollars, but um, that's going to, it's going to uh, protect the, the roadway to um, the Cape Orcas Pier. And some of the other work the town's been doing is Ocean Ave. They just completed work on a seawall in Ocean Ave. Um, this was the one that needed most work. Um, the next few years, they're going to be looking at some other areas, not quite as large as this one, where the, 
the seawall is also going to need to be rebuilt. And the map down at the bottom shows um, the different segments of roadway in town. They're going to be flooded under different sea level rise scenarios. So, for example, um, the purple up here in the legend here, and that's when the sea goes up 1.2 feet, wherever you see that color purple, those roads are, are probably going to get flooded. Um, and then you see the, all, all different ranges here. We have six different scenarios. And, um, it, you know, the higher the ocean gets, obviously, the, the, uh, the more roadways are going to be impacted. And you can see after 3.9 feet rise, that's the bright orange. Um, that means that look at all the orange out of Goose Rocks. That means at high tide, um, pretty much all the roads in Goose Rocks will be, be underwater. And up the top, this chart shows you just how many linear feet of roadway are going to be impacted under each scenario. So, for example, in the top left corner here, um, could be nearly a mile of town roadway will be um, inundated with a sea level rise of 1.2 feet. And of course, the chart goes progressively down. You know, if you have 10 feet of sea level rise, you're going to have uh, several miles of roadway underwater. And it's another threat that a lot of people haven't considered is, is uh, uh, the, the, the impact of sea level rise on groundwater. Um, it's something scientists are discovering more about. And that is when the sea level rises, it's going to push the groundwater up. And that's going to have some impact on the roads. It could have some impacts on septic systems. It could have impact on drinking wells. This is not a road in Cayman-Port, it's, it's somewhere else in Maine. It had some issues with groundwater coming up during February, March, and freeze thaw cycle did a number on the road. Um, but this is what, what it could look like when the groundwater gets pushed up under some of the roads. This will be the, this will be the result. So that's, that's going to be something we're going to have to figure out. Marsh migration. Um, that's a that's an issue that's not widely known, but it's 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 an important one because salt marshes are very important. They're they're uh, they're um, a little incubator for ocean fisheries, and they're very biologically productive. They're fabulous carbon sinks, uh, but as you know, they're right next to the ocean. When the ocean gets higher, what's going to happen to the marsh? Well, scientists discovered marshes can actually move; they can migrate but they don't migrate very fast. It takes time and nobody knows if they're going to be able to migrate fast enough. But we do know is they need a place to migrate. They need a suitable place to migrate to. And what, what the town can do is try to take a look at that and make sure that, you know, we don't build houses and roads and buildings right in the way of where the marsh would, you know, presumably migrate to, because if you do that, then the marsh isn't going anywhere and you lose a salt marsh. Uh, another important natural feature to keep an eye on is the sand dunes at Goose Rocks Beach. Uh, they have great sand dunes. They, this is your best best defense against uh, storm surge of these dunes. Um, but the dunes are surprisingly fragile. If, if the, the, something were to happen to the, the, the dune grass, the dunes would become unstable and your defense would, would disappear very quickly. So it's important to keep, a, uh, keep an eye on the health of the dune grass. Uh, not every community has done that. I can cite a few examples in Massachusetts where they weren't taking it too seriously, and now they're they're kind of in a panic because the dunes are disappearing and, and people's houses are about to fall into the ocean. Um, then we have the, uh, the the three strategies, three main strategies for responding to sea level rise. One is you you fortify, you know, you keep the water out. As we were discussing with the sewer pump stations, you, you try to get them out of harm's way, but you also try to waterproof the enclosures. Um, another option is to live with water, just and that's popular in, in the Netherlands. They're they're promoting that idea because they, they know they don't have much of a choice. And and the other one is of course is retreat. We'll discuss each of these in, in a moment. Uh, this is I don't know who owns this building, but this, these people have the right idea, and you're going to see more and more of this in the future. And this is this is an example of living with water, they're not retreating, but um, they're not going to try to withstand Mother Nature either. So they're doing the sensible thing, and this is going to become more commonplace. And then uh, this is this is what retreat might look like 
Uh, it's not actually a retreat. This is a different event. This is 1951. This is Goose Rocks Beach when the, the neighborhood got out and helped a fellow move a, a building to Goose Rocks Beach from somewhere else in town. And it made the cover of a national magazine. I guess the magazine thought this was a pretty interesting story, and it is. But it's an example of uh, one of your options. If you decide retreat is the only way to go, you can actually um, you can actually move buildings. Back in the 1700s, 1800s, that happened quite a bit. Doesn't happen so much anymore because you know it's 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 um, it's challenging to move them down the public streets with all the utility poles. They they avoided the utility lines in this instance by by moving it on a barge. Uh, and finally, the, the final um, topic I like to throw at you is what are we gonna do about Dock Square? Uh, this this um, photograph here was taken um, earlier this year. It was, it was a storm at sea, so the water is a little higher than usual. But folks down here tell me that um, this type of flooding happens two, three times a year, at least. Um, and it's an indicator that the, the sea level rise is, is creeping up. And the question is, well, what do we do? Um, do, you, do you raise all the buildings? And if you do, well, what about the street? Then you have to raise the street too. And if you raise the street, you have to raise the bridge. So it's getting pretty complicated. And I, uh, this, 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 this problem is, is uh, really, I find it very challenging. And I would love to hear some comments from from folks in the audience is to, so what do we do about Dock Square? Because it's it's one of the most vulnerable places in the state of Maine to sea level rise. It's gonna be one of the first that gets hit pretty hard. So uh, we're running out of time to figure out a solution and I'd like to open up discussion to, to that. And I see there's quite a few comments and questions in the chat as well. Um, but before we get to that discussion, we have one last poll for you, Dave. Can you um, queue up a poll number three? Excellent. We're getting we're getting better at that. So here's your poll. I'm going to give everybody um, one one minute to answer this one. It's just one question. So go at it. You guys have uh, got it figured out by now. And, and in about a minute, we'll close the poll and see what the results are. The question is, what should the town do to reduce the impacts of sea level rise and flooding? You can choose more than one. Okay, um, uh, Dave, could you close the poll and uh, show us the results? Oh, okay, I can see other and nothing didn't do too well. That, that's good, I like that. <laughs> and, uh, and the most popular answer was discourage new development in areas that are likely to be impacted by sea level rise and use land use regulations to accomplish that. Well, that's a very sensible approach, I'd say. Um, and then you know, the second most popular answer was prohibit town-owned structures and locations that are vulnerable to flooding and or sea level rise. Well, that's, I would vote for that as well, particularly if I were a local taxpayer. Um, and uh, the number three is increase stormwater design standards to accommodate more precipitation. So, um, uh, good polling, and uh, we have only a few minutes left, maybe 10 minutes. I'd like to spend the rest of our session um, discussing sea level rise, and um, what are we gonna do about it? Uh, keep the water out, live with water, retreat. Obviously, one strategy doesn't um, fit the whole town. We're gonna have to pick and choose which parts of towns where each strategy is appropriate, but I'd like to hear some comments in, um, on that question. 
Tom, I'll just um, start off with, there's a, there's quite a few comments in the chat. I'm going to focus on the ones that are most, I think, pertinent to this question. And one is where did the sea level rise projections come from? And they are uh, derived from some um, main geological survey data. Um, so that's a... Yeah, it's and, not and, a data yeah. set that we um, put together. It's not a local set. Yeah. It's um, prepared. The, the, other, the other part of the answer is is that uh, uh, the Maine Climate Council has been going at it for a couple of years now, and they they've gathered some of the um, the best climate scientists in the state of Maine to, to answer that question. And the uh, the chart that we showed on that slide back then that was their conclusion. Those are the recommendations from the Maine Climate Council. Um, and they were published in um, December 2020. So a couple of questions. Um, how are we planning to cover the costs of the enhancements needed to roads, dock square, et cetera? We should be building up the tax base for this. Dock square bridge was built high, raise the road and building to match or move to the land across from the consolidated school or elsewhere. We can educate folks that own the private property on how to develop and build in an area that may have sea level rising. Um, I think the land across from the consolidated is going to be in the flood zone. So those are comments coming in from, from the chat. Um, I think that last point is, is a good reminder that there are um, there are going to be impacts, um, hazards that are exacerbated by climate change um, coming from different directions. And so we need to think about inland flooding, um, groundwater rise and sea level rise when we're looking at areas that are vulnerable for, for development in the future. So what about Doc Square? Does anybody have an answer for Doc Square? What are we going to do about Doc Square? And then and, and the comment about who's paying for it was an excellent one. <laughs> Werner. Sure, I'll, uh, you know, I, I don't have the answer for Doc Square. I'll, I'll come right out, you know, with that, uh, you know, that one right off the bat. But I do want to let folks know that, uh, you know, the town uh, was recently selected. So uh, the town in conjunction, you know, in a joint study with the town of Kennebunk was recently awarded uh, the opportunity to, uh, to have Dock Square and Lower Village looked at by uh, a group called uh, the Silver Jackets, which is a planning group that's uh, directed by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, that was going to be taking a look at, uh, you know, exactly this question of, you know, what are some, you know, what are some thoughts and processes that we may consider uh, jointly between uh, Kennebunkport and Kennebunk uh, as we try to answer that question of, you know, what what does the future of Lower Village and Dock Square look like, you know, in the, in the face of changing climate. So, uh, so I, you know, I believe we'll, you know, we'll be starting that, you know, that study work with them, you know, likely uh, towards the end of the year, uh, beginning of next. And, you know, certainly we're going to be looking forward to, you know, to what the core uh, and, uh, you know, and their professional resources that they can bring, uh, you know, to this question. So stay tuned for that. Right, it's good to hear because I know we've been waiting a while to uh, hear whether the town um, got the award. So another comment: uh, the impacts indicate that we need to think about how the town thinks of emergency management. Another comment is raise it or move it. I think that's with respect to um, uh, development in Dock Square. Good point about emergency management. Uh, money can't solve everything. Uh, is this part of the sea level rise planning also regional with the other coastal towns nearby? Werner, do you want to um, clarify the difference between the, the new study and the regional effort with the uh, planning commission? Sure. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. You know, one of the, uh, you know, one of the things that we've, you know, recognized and
around us, it was really important to make sure that we're all dealing with the same, you know, the same lingo, the same standards, you know, things of that nature as we're looking at you know, those impacts. And in that response, uh, a number of coastal communities got together to help fund, uh, you know, a resiliency position through uh, Southern Maine regional planning. So there are, you know, your communities, your coastal communities are working together uh, to try to, you know, address and at least have, you know, the same metrics that we're, you know, that we're using and looking at, um, you know, as we talk about, you know, issues surrounding climate. It looks like it for the uh, chat box at the moment. We got one more, one more comment. Um, well, this shows us there are no easy answers. Thank you all on the committee for working to ask and address all these issues. Um, Connie, thanks. That's a really great point. And the growth planning committee has been working really hard. They've been, um, I think I can speak for Tom. They've been a really tremendous committee to work with. I've really enjoyed all of the meetings. So much thought and effort has gone into reviewing all of the chapters they're all very long everyone reads all of them and um, does a lot of work with um, providing us additional information correcting things and um, i think the growth planning committee and and werner um, really deserve a big round of applause for all their work on this project and i i agree with everything that was just said um so Maybe while we wrap up, Tom, you could scroll to the last, our last slide that has um, our next steps and contact information. Um, again, the Growth Planning Committee meets every third, first and third Tuesday. The meetings have been on Zoom um, for most of COVID. Uh, we had a short hiatus and in person, um, but these, uh, we'll be working to address and hash out a lot of the issues that came up um, this evening, the housing issue, impacts on uh, year-round residents. Um, we'll be continuing to discuss all of these issues and refine the chapters that we've drafted so far, um, and your attendance and participation at those meetings is welcome. You can always reach out over email. Um, or over over the phone if you're not able to make it to those meetings too. And Tom, did you want to jump in? Well, yeah, I just want to add one thing. I see we, we received 57 um, comments and questions by a chat tonight. I just want to let everybody know that we're going to, um, Liz and I are going to go back and look at all 57 and we are going to um, process it. And, and a lot of them really, really are good comments. So we're going to figure out a way to work at the end of the, uh, the the, the comprehensive plan. So um, our next steps are to, um, we'll compile this information. Um, we will review it with our growth planning committee. And then um, as we've mentioned, we're gonna use this to um, help inform the uh, strategies um, that are based on information from all of the topic chapters, the 15 chapters of the plan, and then the future land use chapter. Um, so your your participation is uh, extremely valuable, and right. I see one hand waving right now. Um, so yeah. Ed, yeah, I have a general comment. I think uh, from my view of comprehensive plan over over at least the last ten years, there was a very strong uh, what I'd call a direction to say that growth should be discouraged as it is removed further and further away from town direct resources and, and conveniences. But what's happening in Ken Bunkport is going to continue to be very largely just a factor of market controls that are beyond any town or any growth planning committee's control to be able to have some of the impacts that you might desire to achieve some of the notable goals, especially for lower income housing and, and things that are very near and dear to people. Um, I think there has to be a direction of a real focus on 
development further away from the town resources and, and encouraging development with smaller lot sizes, with policies that will encourage the growth of affordable housing, and that uh, investments and things like the Dock Square, they're going to be managed by people who want to become investors and pay the money to go into those areas and completely shore up larger and more substantial pilings for those buildings and reinvest in those buildings. I think the town is what Werner's going down the road with, with the study of, of looking at how any other, any other, um, you know, uh, municipalities deal with those issues, but they're going to be controlled by investment and by people who can afford to come in and bring private investment to bear because of the return that those retail uh, locations and, and and buildings are going to return for the investor who wants to take that risk. Um, but uh, we've been going, I, I, I've just seen a strong tendency away from growth, further away from town resources. And frankly, I think you need to take an about face and really focus on utilizing forested and land areas that are by market value alone, less expensive and uh, less liable to be, you know, to be the focus of out of state uh, investment in this region, which is going to continue beyond any of the town's control. I mean, would people who can afford to buy oceanfront property will buy oceanfront property. Um, but we do have a tremendous town. We have a character that's unique. We're going to have everybody in the country continuing to want to move here. And we're going to have to have realistic policies to look at where market controls, market controls are going to really be the factors that no growth planning committee is going to be able to overcome and where best strategies are going to be to utilize the things that we can control uh, and at the same time, grow our tax base to take care of some exp very expensive uh, infrastructure projects that we are going to foresee, especially with all these sea rise issues, which are going to be real within the next several you know decades. That's my comment. Thanks, Ed. I think that you highlight a good point that um, the comprehensive plan um, process can't solve all, all of the issues. Um, and, but one thing that we will try to do is identify what further studies um, and work needs to be done in different, um, different topic areas um, to, to help negotiate some of these challenges. Um, there's a couple more comments, I think, in the interest of time. Um, we're going to save the comments and um, feel free to skim through them yourself right now before you log off. But we want to be mindful of the hour. We're a few minutes over eight o'clock. Um, Dan, uh, do you want to say, say any closing remarks before we sign off? Sure thing, Liz. Thank you very much. Uh, and I do appreciate uh, your comments, Liz, uh, on our, our GPC. I think we do work uh, hard on on this and, and appreciate you and, and Tom and your work in, in guiding us um, through this process. It's uh, it's it's going to hopefully be a uh, you know an improved plan. Every time you do a plan, it, it should make itself better. Um, appreciate all the comments from everyone who participated. Uh, you can see the, I think, the unique challenges we face as uh, a town that's well liked by many people in the, this country uh, who want to come here and visit here, uh, but also has many challenges being a coastal town uh, that sea level rise is going to bring. And we have to sort of balance all these competing uh, needs uh, in a plan that will provide direction on where we need to go. Uh, to not only the next 10 years, but the next 50, the next 100 years to set it up for success. Uh, but at the same time, be very, say, say, flexible to allow for the town to adjust based on what reality brings. Um, and having more people involved in this process uh, in, in sessions like this, this and participating in our meetings is uh, really encouraged. And uh, I hope uh, you all stay engaged and uh, if you can't attend every meeting, that's fine. But uh, send us feedback. Uh, if you can watch it afterwards, uh, we would appreciate it. 
trying to be as transparent as possible in a, in a sort of a pandemic period where it's tough to get together. So I thank you all for taking time tonight. And I wish you all a safe evening. Thank you, Daniel.